Welcome to Something to Talk About from the Bainbridge Island Senior Community Center. And the Senior Community Center works really closely with the Bainbridge Island Photo Club. We're kind of joined at the hip. We're kind of sister organizations. We're glad to support the Photo Club. And so today we're going to be talking about one of their big events of the year, the 4th of July Photo Show People's Choice Awards. Um, I want to mention, though, that our um, programs at the Senior Center for the these Something to Talk About programs are underwritten with the help of Fieldstone Memory Care on Bainbridge Island. Fieldstone offers innovative and compassionate care, and they're accepting residents. They also offer day stay and respite programs. Here's a number to write down if you'd like to get a tour or find out more. 360-689-4314. Every month we check in with you guys at the Photo Club, uh, but today, instead of speaking with one photographer, um, we're going to look at a number of uh, photos, and Diane Hutchins, who helped organize, spearheaded this year's 4th of July People's Choice Awards, is going to kick us off to tell us a little bit about what we'll be looking at and sort of the history of that, uh, that awards, that annual awards activity. Hi, Diane. Hello, and first off, I just want to thank you, Reed, again for uh, sponsoring us and supporting us because it's a big part of, you know, you know. Anyway, we really appreciate that, and it's nice to be able to share this. Um, so anyway, yes, this is a, our big event of the year is the July Fourth Print Show, and we're really we're really happy to have it back this year. We had kind of an abbreviated version of it last year due to COVID, um, but uh, so the last big one we did was 2019. And I actually don't know how many years we've been doing this. There's probably somebody here that knows that, but it's it's gone on for quite a number of years and folks really do in the community look forward to it. Some people kind of come upon it by surprise, but there's many that just say, oh, we look forward to this every year at, on July 4th. So it's a lot of fun and it's a, a chance for our photographers to showcase their best work and, you know, in this form of print. So anyway. And so it was very well attended this year. Um, we had uh, 626 visitors. And we did ask, uh, each year we asked people to vote if they want to for their top number. And we uh, went with their top five of the regular prints. Then we also had four panoramas. So we had a total of 108 prints on display uh, in addition to the four pan panoramas. And, um, so today we're going to be featuring the people that got the um, the ten people the People's Choice Award the top ten votes uh, for the regular prints plus two additional panoramas. Most of those photographers are here that can speak to their piece, but uh, there's a few that weren't able to make it. And I have um, some something that I told them I would share about their images when we get to that. Um, let's see here. I, I also just want to say the quality of the prints overall is just uh, really impressive. And, uh, you know, I'm pretty proud of this club and I think everybody who's in it should be, so. Yes, as a voter, as a voter, I would say, it was very <laughs> hard to pick five. Yeah, well, oh, let me, I wanted to share a quote. Um, there was one woman that came through and as she was leaving, um, we asked how it went. She said, well, it was delightfully difficult to choose. And, you know, I thought that was a, anyway, a funny quote. So anyway, so um, I think that we're ready to go ahead and share them. Oh, um, I will say that, uh, well, you'll see this, but Bob Rosenberg, Rosenblatt rather, got four of the awards at the top. So he did very well. So. So we can go ahead and um, show these. So this is Bob's and he'll start out talking. Okay, yeah, hi everybody. And yeah, I, I, again, I thought the quality of the prints this year was was really wonderful. And, and I will say I'm humbled and, uh, and, and a little surprised about, you know, how well some of mine did, but you know, it was a, overall the club I think did itself proud. Um, this photo I'll just talk about, this is, I call this uh, Death Valley Sunset. And Dorothy and I last fall went on a photo workshop with Brian Peterson to uh, basically Nevada. Um, and we drove over and spent a couple of 
couple three days in Death Valley. Anyway, we this is a place called Badwater Basin. It's actually the lowest place in North America. I think it's almost 300 feet below sea level. And um, these are salt crystals. There are these kind of waves and waves of these salt crystals, and they're they're about four to six inches high. Um, one of the guys that was helped leading the workshop has been out there many times. We were out there specifically to shoot stars, and he said he'd never seen the salt crystals that high. So it was, you know, but they were really hard. So if you fell down, we we were out there till that well after dark shooting the stars, and then walking back, you had to be very careful because if you tripped on one of these things, they were just sure. razor sharp. Mm -hmm and stuff. But anyway, while we were setting up to get ready to shoot the stars, the sun was setting behind the clouds and it, it just, it was remarkable. Uh, just a beautiful sunset and it, but it was extremely harsh lighting. I had a, 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 what's called a graduated neutral density filter that it, uh, only lets through one eighth as much light on the um, top of the filter as on the bottom and I was holding this up in front of my lens to try to balance out the light because the sun was so bright and I was trying to keep some of the light on the salt but anyway it was just it was a magical sunset and to me it was that was more fun really than the uh, shooting the stars that we were there for so but anyway that was I it was I have not been to Death Valley since I was like six years old with my family and I, I think Dorothy and I are definitely going to go back again. So, anyway, that's it, unless there's any questions or comments. No? Okay. okay. Um, this one is, I called it Mergansers in the Fog. This was shot in Blakely Harbor. And I was actually down in Blakely Harbor walking around, um, I think maybe February. It was this winter, and I think it was maybe February. And I was actually looking for black and white pictures, but these two mergansers were way in deep into uh, Blakely Harbor, right at the head of it. And it was a foggy morning and what light there was, you know, the sun was, I was facing east, so I was kind of facing into the sun, but the pond there was just remarkably still. And so um, I overrode the meter. I think I had like three stops of overexposure to get the, the mergansers exposed correctly, which kind of blew out all the fog. I really like, but I snapped away a few pictures of this and then the female started to squawk and peck at the male. So he got annoyed and jumped in the water and swam away. So it was just a momentary spot there where these two mergansers posed for me. And I was very, very excited, very pleased to see this. Was that taken in the back bay or out just in the regular? It was in, way in the back bay, past, yeah. past the bridge, in, inbound from the, bri uh, from the bridge. And I think maybe that's partly why the water was so remarkably still. I really love this. Yeah, so do I. I was wondering about the, um, you said that you were shooting into the fog and you had to overexpose. Then did you do any uh, work on the, on the image afterwards to make sure there was no other uh, distraction in the background? Really very little. I think I may have lightened up, brushed in, a lightened it up a tiny bit, Reed, but there was really nothing else there other than the water and this this log that they were sitting on. So there was really almost nothing to do. I think I may have cropped it a little bit too. Um, this was shot with a 500 millimeter lens, but I still, you know, cropped it a little bit more to get in a little tighter. But it was just, it was just, you know, just a beautiful morning. You know, not what I was there for. I was looking for black and white photos, but it was still, it was just a beautiful morning. Such a perfect mirror image. Yeah, just it, it was just you know literally like a like a mill pond or glass or something. It was just so smooth. And then of course once the the male jumped in the water to swim, it was all it was gone. <laughs> I guess. Oh, I guess we're doing this one there. Um, this was actually a tie with the next one with Chuck's, but um, Dorothy and I also went on another workshop with Brian in. Um, August, I think it was the end of August, or no, end of July, beginning of August, sorry. Um, we were going to Kodiak Island and Dorothy and I got there a couple days ahead of time just to kind of look around on our own. And Brian was in between workshops and he, he kind of said, well, hey, you know, he had a woman that worked for him that was not part of the workshop. And so she was gonna jump on a float plane and go to the west end of the island. And she had a, uh, her son and a, a friend with her. And, and they said, well, if you guys want, Brian was going to go with him. But Brian said, I don't know. I don't need to go. I've been there before. 
So we bought Brian's plane seat from him. And so that so the five of us with a guide flew out to the west end of um, mm -hmm. Kodiak Island. And this is a fishing spot, and not a fishing spot, a spot by Fish and Wildlife that Alaska uh, officials use to count the salmon coming in. And it's about a mile hike from where the seaplane, the float plane dropped us off. It's about a mile hike through the shrubs. So we actually had an armed guard with us. And I decided later he had the rifle to shoot one of us if we opened our granola bars at the wrong time. Um, but so he was, he walked us in there and the bears were just totally focused on, on the salmon um, and each other. There was mothers with cubs that were, you know, protecting, guarding, guarding the cubs from the male, the boars and stuff. But we just, we spent, what, two or three hours there. Then the pilot came back and said a storm was coming. He said, we're going and we're going now. So unfortunately we didn't spend nearly as long out there as we wanted to. And then the workshop we were officially signed up for was supposed to go back out at the end of the week and they never got to go out um, weather. because the weather, the weather was so bad. So we were just very fortunate to get out there for this, for this one time. It was just a real, real highlight to see these uh, brown bears. And not so, if you were salmon, not so good to see them, I guess. But for us, it was remarkable. In fact, <laughs> yeah, they our guard, kind of disturbed the salmon count a little bit. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, <laughs> our the the guard actually. I mean, he he put down his rifle and picked up his camera. He was having fun with the rest of us and stuff. So yeah. So anyway, it was a beautiful beautiful morning, and just we were very fortunate to get there because, like I say, in fact, as we flew back to Kodiak from the west end of the island, the the float plane pilot was flying lower and lower because the cloud deck was getting lower and lower. And I think we almost, we were joking that we were gonna end up landing and taxiing back to Kodiak because we were getting so low. So we, you know, we stayed, a, we couldn't have stayed any longer. In fact, the pilot probably should have kicked us out sooner, but we were very glad to get every minute we had out there. So. Amazing. What a great experience. It was wonderful. Okay, so um, this is taken by Chuck Eklund and he wasn't able to be here today. So he sent me something to read about. And I just have to say I'm really envious because I like to photograph birds and I have yet to get a good one of an owl. And this one is just outstanding, I think. But anyway, this is what Chuck wrote. Um, this juvenile bar barred owl flew in front of me when my wife and I were walking our dog. It landed on a branch and turned its back on us, which surprised me. When I started taking its pictures, it turned and gave me this look. I love owls and their expressions. This one seemed typical. Like all humans, I was found somewhat wanting, however. I was doing something that required further scrutiny. Uh, this picture was taken with a short telephoto lens. For, for those of us who were at the uh, last meeting, and we saw a picture of uh, Chuck holding a drape, don't these two look awful lot similar to each other. I think you got a point, Norm. I think that what makes this picture for me is the, the fact that the owl's looking back over its shoulder. No. That just adds Definitely. so much personality. Yeah, it's unique. Yeah. yeah, it's a unique and kind of a special pose. <laughs> Fabulous. Well, this one was done by Dawn and she's here. So maybe you're muted, Dawn. Oh, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm sorry. Um, I like trying to photograph birds, as everyone knows. And I was out at the Battle Point Pond. Um, with all of the flocks of ducks that come flying in to uh, feed on all the food that people spread out for them. And it's really hard to try to get these in motion pictures because um, it, it just is like you have to get the speed just right and you have to everything and you don't get second chances. It's one shot and that's it. <laughs> so. I was experimenting when I took this with a flash that is made for uh, photographing wildlife or birds at a distance because it has sort of a magnifying glass that projects the, the um, beam of light further. And I just was trying to get shots as these birds were flying in and out of the pond and 
I just happened to get this one. It was like, oh, my, to me, <laughs> oh, my goodness, I can't believe it because it's all very sharp and it, it, it you know, the whites aren't really that blown out or anything. And uh, it was uh, many, many, many tries to get something like this. And I really like this photograph. Mm. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's gorgeous. It's it's really hard to do that. I I have not been very successful. So. <laughs> yeah, I like what you it. said, Don, about the whites not being blown out. It has just such a lovely color palette. Mm -hmm. In addition to the idea that you know the um, the field of focus is pretty uh, short. Obviously, the top is a little blurry, but boy, the distinction of the of um, of the feet and the beak are amazing yeah i mean it, it's it was when when they're in motion like this it is really hard to try to get a good picture and i've done many 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 tries at it and this is just one of those special ones that that everything went right but you don't get second chances at the same picture you can't say oh well i need to you know expose that a little bit or i need to up this or that you don't have a second chance. It's, it's like you guess right the first time and, and maybe you'll get a picture like that. And I've guessed wrong lots of times and have lots of <laughs> pictures you're that are good, deleted. You're a good but guesser. But this was a really special one. That's, that's really good guessing on, on your part. I think it's, those are the kind of guesses that come from expertise. Yes. John, do you remember what aperture you were using? I usually I usually use when I'm photographing the birds probably an f 5.6 or an f8. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you know, but you know the exposure and the ISO and all that kind of stuff kind of fluctuates. Um, and and it's not and to me it's not an exact science when it comes to these in motion pictures mm -hmm. <laughs> like this. Because you never really know. I mean, because this one obviously was coming up out of the water because you can see the the um, drips of water yeah. coming off of it at the bottom. And he was probably just taking off. And um, and I, I, I just was lucky, that's all. <laughs> so I have a question. Um, do you... Do you think that your flash made the, all the difference in getting this, you know, being able to get exposure right? Or I think it, I, I, I can't swear to it, but, you know, because some, some of my work trying to use the flash has not been particularly successful. But the fact that, that, that his head and his feet and his body are all um, pretty sharp and they're not they're not that dark they mm -hmm. didn't get that dark because the wings obviously you know they are a little the whites are in some places a little blown out but not enough to distract from the picture so i think it did help and i've had other pictures that i've tried um with the flash and trying to get birds in motion or stop their actions and the flash does help, but it, it's it's really tricky. It um, mm -hmm. gets very uh, mixed results. So I guess if I practice more, I could get better at it. But I, I originally got this flash from one of our trips to the Northwest Council of Canner Clubs when George Lepp was uh, showing some of his pictures. And he had... Um, uh, some pictures that he had used this particular flash, you know, that projects your your uh, flash a long ways. And I thought, oh, wow, that should be worth trying because, of course, he has gorgeous pictures. But um, uh, so this this is one of my attempts at it that I felt was successful. Yes. Very, very nice. Super nice. Mm. Oh, yes, this is Pearl. That's what I named her anyway. Um, uh, 
some, sometimes in the evening, this was taken um, last June in the evening. And sometimes in the evening, Bob and I like to go, we have a community um, deck down below our condo. And we like to go down there and take sunset pictures. And sometimes we'll take a glass of wine with us down and have a sip of wine and take a picture and kind of enjoy the evening. And Pearl here was enjoying her evening too. And, um, and it was just, this is strictly a moment, one of those moment pictures where she stopped long enough in just the right spot. And um, there's not a, a, a hugely special story behind it, except for, oh, look, catch it now. And so I did. That's Henrietta. <laughs> just, in case, just in case you want to know, that's her name. <laughs> Well, this is one of my. I favorites. think this is a gorgeous picture, and I, the black and white makes it great. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank Beautiful. you. And how the the heron is centered right above the, the back. Mm. Of the, yeah, this is yeah, it's perfect. It's just it was really just one of those moments where you grab it while it's there, and so you know I can't say it's it's an incredibly talented moment except for that it, it just was there for me and and I took it. And it looks like the voters agree with many of you that birds make for great photographs. <laughs> yeah. And this is mine. And I was on a road trip recently to Idaho. This particular location is uh, mid-central Idaho. And I was just, I was looking for a place to, to uh, camp one night and I come across this area. It was midday when I came, uh, came across the area. And so I figured out that yeah, at some point in the evening, you should be able to see the Milky Way and, and all of that kind of stuff. So I went on a place to camp, came back, and this is taken probably like about 2.30 in the morning by 3.30. Thirty. It was it was entirely gone because the moon uh, had risen behind me, so the Milky Way was totally gone. But this is actually I'll call it two panels. So the bottom portion is two horizontal shots taken at exposed, much lighter than the sky was exposed, and then the uh, the sky itself was. Uh, two horizontal shots, uh, and it included part of the uh, the tree line. And so I put all four of these together in Photoshop and just had them stitch it together for me. And and that's how this pretty much turned out. I didn't have to do a lot to it to uh, to uh, make the photograph turn out right. But I obviously I played around with the color and all that sort of thing. But uh, this is a, this is a four shot panel really. So. You, Norman, you say that's at 2.30 in the morning, so what's the light behind the mountains? Well, you know, the, the, the more I do this stuff, the more I find that, that the light is, comes from, you know, ambient light from whatever it is that happens to be around. Um, I, I did another one a couple of months ago, the one that was over in eastern Washington, and had a lot of light coming from, where in the world was a Walla Walla. It was coming from Walla Walla. Walla Walla was 60 miles away. And there's still, there's just flat out a lot of light pollution that's out mm. there. You know, it could be just a, just a small town. I'll tell you what's close. There's an air base that's fairly close. that's outside of the mountains here. That's probably where this was coming from. So gotcha. yeah, there, it's, it's surprisingly, difficult to find places with with uh, virtually no light pollution. So it's out there. I don't think it hurts this image. I think it's- Oh, no, I don't, no, I don't think it does either. Mm. Yeah, no, it's it, nice. It, it probably enhances it a little bit. I think it would be, mm -hmm. be a far different photograph without that, that light back mm. there. Yeah, I think the light is what's reflecting off the water, which really, really does accentuate the mm. foreground. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. Beautiful. Hmm. 
Uh, this is me again. And after after we got done at Barrow, um, uh, excuse me, at Kodiak, we flew up to the town formerly known as Barrow, now officially known as Utkiatvik. Um, I spent a lot of time in Barrow in the early 2000s. And outside of town, I knew where the snowy owls hung out. So while Dorothy and I were up there, we rented a car for a couple of days and spent quite a bit of time. This was actually taken about sunrise. I mean, it was like, I don't know, 6, 6, 6 30 in the morning. Um, and we were up there at sunrise and this, this snowy owl actually, he, he's got a lemming, but he stole a lemming on the other side of the road from an Arctic fox. The okay. fox had gotten a lemming. The snowy owl flew down, stole a lemming from the fox, then flew across the road, but then he dropped the lemming. He was going back in to, to, to recapture the lemming. So I, but in the meantime, we just stopped the car and I was leaning across. I had a my, the 500 millimeter lens with a times two tele-extender and I just laid the lens on the roof of the car. I didn't have time to get a tripod out or anything. I just laid the lens on the roof of the car and shot over as this guy was going in to get his, his lemming. And then we got to sit there and watch him beat the lemming. But anyway, so this is just, it's, it was just one of those moments and stuff, but it really, um, I guess the thing is I, I, I knew from my time up in Barrow where to go, where to go look for snowy owls and so it was a lot of fun. To see. All right, a little uh, episode of Wild Kingdom. That's right. <laughs> oh, Dorothy points out this was actually September. Okay, so I had my timing wrong. But yeah, this is September. So hence that's why sunrise was so relatively late. So, anyway, but anyway, that's it. So this shot was taken by John Root, and he's not here today. And this actually was tied with the, the owl, so for, I guess, eighth place. Anyway, this is... I do, uh, I do see John Root here, but maybe... Oh, you do? Well, I thought he wasn't going to make it. Maybe he doesn't want to open up his microphone. Oh, well, you know, if he's, he, I definitely would like him to speak for himself if he is here. Well, um, go ahead. Okay, well, John, I apologize if you're had intended to do this, but I, he provided this to me, so I'll go ahead and read it. This image was taken last December 31st in central Kansas. I have photographed this house several times over the last 10 years, watching it slowly deteriorate. The starkness of the winter scene goes well with the house and the outhouses that are now without any paint and have only weathered bare boards or missing siding remain. This along with the sagging house that one can see through leafless tree and leaning windmill add to a forlornness that is striking to the viewer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would add that the uh, trees are pretty expressive in this. Yeah. <laughs> they seem to be uh, weeping a bit themselves in their <laughs> nakedness. And that window is, if the window is broken, we're seeing the sky through the window? Or we're seeing a reflection of the sky. Oh, I think that's the sky. It's open, but I actually don't know. That's a good question. Yeah, he did. He did say that you can see through the building. Yeah. Oh, okay. I misunderstood that. Wow. Mm -hmm. Be a fun place to visit on Halloween. <laughs> Ah, that's mine. Um, first, I want to just quickly thank um, the Center for supporting and providing our photography group with so many opportunities to share our work. Mm -hmm. And it's an honor for me to be among the winners of the People's Choice Awards as I have so much respect and admiration for the talents and generosity of the members of our uh, Bainbridge uh, Photography Club. So one of my favorite Ansel Adams quotes, not to in any way compare myself to the one of the best photographers who ever lived, is his quote is, sometimes I do get to places just when God is ready to have somebody click the shutter. <laughs> so on May 15th, I was in the right place at the right time the right place, Southern California, where the skies were crystal clear, and I was able to point my camera for two hours 
uh, on an unobstructed view of the supermoon, which was, went through a total lunar eclipse. It was an incredible, incredible sight. An added benefit of my location in LA is that I'm very, very familiar with the flight path of jets heading from the north and the west towards LAX. And so after two hours of snapping photos, the moon rose to the exact point of the jet flight path. And I was fortunate to capture the moment. I used the tripod for my Sony mirrorless Alpha 3S camera and my settings, I used a 300 millimeter lens and my settings were F13, 1 1 25th of a second and the ISO was 200. And the title I chose was a result of my being over the moon about the way the image turned out. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful really, lifetime shot. <laughs> yeah, I think it's really cool. Jane. Beautiful. Really cool. Good Thanks. patience there, waiting on that. Yeah, perfect. So it wasn't no. just luck. You, 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 you had some information that helped you to capture that mm -hmm. for sure, but yeah, really nice. I am I am noticing though that many of you photographers are talking about um, the fortune of being at the right place at the right time and just having it work out. Obviously, if you don't know what to do when you're there, <laughs> it would make it a little more difficult. But uh, there is some serendipity in this line of creativity. Yes, yeah. indeed. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Read. Um, all of these photos are on uh, our website, biphotoclub.org. So they're all, all posted there. And they'll be on the ledge you know, in the print form through the end of July. That's right. You can come to the center and see them in the lobby area, uh, what we affectionately call the ledge, uh, where every month there are photographs from the Bainbridge Island Photo Club. And these photos are also, as you can see, on the Senior Center website. But um, we will make a link in the, if you're watching this later on YouTube, there's a link in the uh, description down below of uh, how you can get to biphotoclub.org. So this is the first place panorama. This was taken by Lydia Gregoff, and she's not here today. So um, Lydia, Tends, she's an architect, has been for many, many years. And so most of her photographs involve some architecture, but she does do nature. And I think this is a really nice combination of the two that she did. And I like the black and white and um, the light. And so it's, uh, it definitely draws your attention. It's, um, so I'm just trying to see if there's anything else she wanted me to mention. Um, let's see. She, uh, she says that she likes to use light to express, um, reveal the quality of the architecture, structure, and the beauty of nature. So there, this would be an example of that. Well, she obviously took it from the ferry because- Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, she took it from the ferry. The, the, yes. the wash and that trail is so great because it just leads your eye mm -hmm. into the picture. Yeah, thank you. I meant to mention that. But I guess that's obvious. <laughs> you know, the thing that amazes me about living out here, as we do in this beautiful country, um, are the clouds. Mm -hmm. The clouds are in this are amazing, amazing. The different types, the different sizes, the colors and so on and so forth are just amazing. Uh, I was seeing them yesterday when I was over at the, at the uh, Pride Festival and looking out towards the west and seeing the different colors of, again, of the clouds coming in. We're, we're, it's, it's magnificent. Uh, just, just, just the clouds are just amazing. I agree, Sheila. I'm always looking up at the clouds around here. It's just, uh, it, they're, yeah. So much variety and just over water and land. I don't know what it is, but it's uh, there's um, really fun to see. If I'm remembering correctly, a lot of Lydia's photos in the show were a splash with color, and this one is uh, powerful in its uh, yeah. 
in its monochrome or whatever. Yeah, you're right. And then we have one more. Uh -huh. And this is mine. I took this uh, recently on a trip to, uh, to the Palouse area. And this is just a quintessential Palouse photograph. So this is actually a uh, photograph that I cropped down into uh, panorama size. It's only, it's just, just the one image that I just cropped out of the panorama size. Mm -hmm. So nothing, nothing, I didn't do anything to it. It's just, it is what it is. I just <laughs> thought I'd take it. Great. I love the patterns and the colors of that area. Oh, the Palouse is amazing. Absolutely. The first time I ever, I, I remember um, my trip over to Wazoo uh, to see my granddaughter um, was my first time to the Palouse. And my daughter and my son-in-law kept saying, wait, just wait, just wait until you see it. Just wait. <laughs> and I, and it just got better and better and better as we went along. And this just captures it. Oh my goodness, yes. Uh, the, we went and when we went over was in March, so it was snowy. You know, it was it was it was blank. It was bleak, but it wasn't. It was so full of life. It was beautiful. Do you know what those dark pieces, the bark, the bark, dark thing is down there? The dark lines. Those are are you talking about? Are you talking about the brown? No, I'm talking. Well, I don't know. They look as though they're dark. No, are, I'm dark. Yeah, in there. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, well. I, I think what it is, I think that it's a field that they plow part of it and probably the other part all is, you know, uh, sage or something, something like that. that. That's what I think it is. Okay. Yeah, this is gorgeous. I spent 40 years in the Palouse starting in 1968. And it's interesting how pictures of it have changed over the years um, with farming customs changing. When I first got there in the late spring, you could see these green fields just going on endlessly, just green, 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 green. And then the, the farmers were taught that you need to leave these fields fallow sometimes. So you, mm. you do one strip and uh, leave the other strip fallow for a while. And then that made a whole different look to the whole thing. And then uh, a few years, well, a few decades ago now, they started growing rape as well as wheat, which has these bright yellow blossoms. And that made another big contribution to the way the Palouse fields look. Yeah, the mustard, the mustard flowers, yeah. And this, yep. this house out here and really makes the shot though for me, there are not very mm -hmm. many houses out there in the Palouse. Mm -hmm. I, I once went on a short lecture tour with a Russian author and two of us were speaking about science fiction actually. I took him over to give a talk at, at uh, WSU and uh, as we were driving along he said, well, where do the peasants live? <laughs> I, this is during Gorbachev's time and I thought, do you still use the word peasants for farmers? <laughs> So I explained to them it was highly mechanized and, you know, people got hands to come in for the harvest, but most of it was done by machinery. And he was just... Us. Yes, the peasants, the peasants are often college students as well as uh, <laughs> <laughs> traveling workers. But just the fact that there were so few houses and all this farmed land was just beyond his imagination. Yeah. And, well, and, and of course... The, the first... Uh, the whole first layer of the um, of the ground out there is is the ash from Mount St. Helens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, and, it, and of course, the, the the peasants are multi 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 millionaires. <laughs> Who vote Republican? <laughs> yeah. yeah. One of the things I would like to just say back to the image itself is that it looks so painterly. Yes. Uh, there's a there's an aspect of it that makes me think I could be looking at a, a you know a Van Gogh or something. Mm -hmm. Which yeah. you know you may have just snapped the shot, Norm, but uh, <laughs> you picked a good one. Yeah. 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 Well, good. Beautiful. Good. 
Well, oh, there's, yeah. there's a real art to cropping, too. That's right. Very nice crop. So if somebody is interested in, uh, inspired by this, Diane, can you tell us a little bit about the photo club and um, how to get involved? Well, um, we do have a website um, and uh, it's uh, gamebridgeislandphotoclub.org. Yeah. Org, I believe dot it. org. Is it org? Yes, dot org. Okay, sorry. I, I should know that. That's embarrassing. Um, but anyway, um, we... You know, a lot of times people join the club because they just, they know a member, they just, you know, they approach somebody, one of us with a camera when we're out and about. And, you know, I, I tend to kind of share that information. If I find out somebody really likes to take photos, I usually will mention our club. And we've gotten quite a number of new members, um, even during COVID, it's kind of nice. And um, we have about 40 people and uh, you don't have to be a member to even attend. Um, our meeting. So sometimes if people aren't sure this is what they want to do, we just say, well, just come in to a couple of meetings and meet us and see what we're about. And, and I think I know of several people recently that have um, joined that um, one in particular, he just said it was so great because he kind of lost his enthusiasm for photography. He'd been doing it for a number of years, but um, getting involved again was really kind of recharged his enthusiasm. So I thought that was nice. And I can certainly say that for me. I, I joined six years ago um, when I took up photography for the first time. And it's just such a great group, um, so much generosity, so much talent. Um, and I just can't say enough good things about it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for sharing all these uh, photos with us every month and uh, great show this year. <laughs>